Um, after they eat the fruit and they understand they're naked, they hide from God. And God goes, why are you hiding? And they said, because we're naked. And God's response is, who told you you were naked? And I'm like, really? You knew we were naked all along and you weren't telling us? Like, I was like, there's a lot of other things I wish you would have said at that moment, and that was not one of them. In the eighth grade, my middle school took our uh, eighth grade class on a trip to Washington, D.C. And the adult me, who has now been in camping and worked with children, junior high, senior high youth for over 40 years, I think about that trick, trip and I'm in stunned disbelief. <laughs> the supervision was so sporadic and passive, but we survived. And I think it was because it was such a foreign environment that we really didn't really test the boundaries of anything. But, uh, but one evening, before curfew, the four boys, or the three boys and myself in our room, went over to the girls' room next door where there was four girls, and we sat in there and we talked. And it was one of those, you know, embarrassing junior high conversations, you know, where that tension is there, and you look back now and what a silly, stupid conversation it was. But you know... In junior high, the ultimate destination for conversations usually is sex. And so there is this memory that's forged deep in my mind, this incident that happened while we were there. One of the girls turned to me and asked, Eric, do you know what the Bible, what the apple in the Bible is? I looked down, I, 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 my blank stare opened the room for further clarification. She says, you know, when, Ad, when Eve eats the apple in the garden, do you know what the apple is? Again, my face revealed the clueless state that I was in, which caused her to scream, oh my gosh, Eric doesn't know what the apple is. That's unbelievable, which gets all the other seven kids to jump in and go, oh, we can't believe Eric doesn't know what the apple is. Oh my gosh. Then she started to explain the apple is the forbidden fruit of sex. And Edom, Eve made Adam eat it, and God got mad. Oh, I can't believe you don't know that, Eric. You're so stupid. Now, I don't want to shame or question the biblical exegetical wisdom of 13-year-old Marlene Johnson... But where did she get that story from? Nowhere does it say it's an apple. It is just the fruit of the tree. And more importantly, nowhere is sex talked about in the story. Eating from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, according to the snake, will open your eyes and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Marlene Johnson did Jot just make up that answer? And I doubt she read a lot of biblical commentaries at the time. Someone had to tell her that was the meaning. And she listened to the voice of the one who was speaking. It was part of a popular understanding of Gar the Garden of Eden story. It wasn't limited to her. It was popular all over. But does popular interpretation mean true or a faithful interpretation? Any time, any time we read, study, or preach on the early chapters of Genesis, creation, Adam and Eve, the story we read today often referred to as the fall, the reader of that text, whether you're doing that at home, the leader of a study if you're leading a group, or a preacher preaching a sermon, will have to fight people's inclination to embrace the popular interpretation that formed them over the more faithful interpretation. This story is not a documentary. It's a story. There were no reporters in those first moments of creation, the time of Adam and Eve, nor during the aging of the talking snakes. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are not the sole dominion of Judaism or Christianity. These ancient stories were told across the globe by different tribes of people long before any form, anyone formed organized religion or it was, religion was even conceived. Archaeologists and sociologists have found stories that reflect the same storyline of creation, 
of Adam and Eve, of the fall, of Noah's flood, in completely unconnected communities across the globe. They found them in ancient tribes living in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Islands, in Asia, in South America. No one knows their origin, but they were passed on from one generation to the next. And the elders of the community spoke their words to their children. The children listened to these stories, and they listened to those voices. They remembered the stories and passed them on throughout time to us. Sometimes, sometimes my heart gets heavy with grief when I think about this generation. Will this generation be the first to stop listening to these stories? Will they be the first to stop telling them to the next generation? Stories that very well could be hundreds of thousands of years old. And even when we do tell the stories, will we choose popular trends or the faithful interpretation? For example, at no point in history did anyone believe the earth was created in seven days. Never was true. If you go back and look at the ancient creeds of the church, it was always that God is the author of life, of all that is, seen and unseen. They knew it was a mechanism, the seven days was a mechanism for telling the more important story, which is God is the author and source of all life, seen and unseen. And God creates order out of chaos. And into this created world, God provides partners and communities to share in the work of caring for ourselves and creation. We've exchanged popular interpretations about Adam and Eve as though God was establishing a pecking order of who is above the other. At the expense of the more faithful interpretation that the diversity of male and female reflects the diversity of God. God created humanity in God's own image, not in ours. As for our reading today, our hearts tend to be pulled into popular questions or meanings. Did God create evil? Oof. If so, why did God create evil? Why did God tempt them with that fruit in the middle of the garden anyway? God's to blame. Now, is Adam really responsible for eating the fruit, or did Eve entice them, even though the story says they were standing right next to each other when the snake talked? And as for my eighth grade classmate, Marlene Johnson declared, the fruit is the apple, the apple of S-E-X. Oof. I personally, and absolutely fascinated by these early books in the Bible, these, especially these first three chapters. And what I find incredibly interesting about them is that long before we understood anything about the Big Bang Theory, and any time, long before we could trace how the world was created, how humans were created, how plants were created, long before any of that, there was this ancient story. And it's amazing to me in how those first three verses in that story really speak to you a Big Bang. And that story opens and go, then moves on, and it follows the development that we now know to be true. That there had to be this slamming together of matter, and there had to be the separating of water and land and air and sky, and you just go through and you're like, oh my gosh, that's how it works. And I don't say this to say it proves the Bible. I ask a different question. How did they know? Amazingly accurate. How did they know this is how it worked? As I've listened to, and part of the time I believe this, theologians teaching on Adam and Eve will tell you they're not real people, but tribes of people. And we know something is bigger taking place because who's going to threaten Cain after he killed Abel, right? And if you get too caught up into Adam and Eve, you know in the story they only have two kids, Cain and Abel. I don't know how we procreated after that, right? Interesting how modern population geneticists who have studied mitochondrial DNA have actually located the original Adam and Eve. And they have found and now identified lineages of descendants from 10 sons of Adam and 18 daughters from Eve. Not that it proves the Bible right. Again, I find it fascinating. How did they know? If we read the Bible like a documentary, 
recording actual events as they happened and how they happened. The story easily falls apart and belief in an all-powerful God just kind of fades away. However, if we search for the truth, the more meaningful reading of these stories, we will find they speak a truth as real today as they did when they were told to cave dwellers in some ancient land. Adam and Eve and the talking snake is a fascinating story. And this is what I was preparing for the sermon. I read an absolutely fascinating commentary by uh, Dennis Olson, the professor of Old Testament theology at Princeton Seminary. And he made a, really, a couple of really interesting points worth sharing. Number one, God created a good world, but not a perfect one. If you read the story... The primeval deep, these waters, these storms of chaos that God um, puts to the side, he just, God just peels those back, doesn't get rid of them, doesn't eliminate them, understands that they just did not disappear. The world is good, but it is not perfect. And God is still able to bring order out of the chaos. Number two, the popular understanding of Genesis chapter 3 is that the serpent represents Satan and seduces Adam and Eve to sin. However, in its original context, as we read today, the serpent is just intelligent. He's just intelligent and clever and talkative. And all the serpent does is pose a question with some alternative explanations to the story God told. Adam and Eve, at any point in that conversation, could have just said, you know what, serpent... You're full of it. Please go away and don't bother us anymore. They could have done that. Except they stayed. They listened. They followed. Not the serpent's suggestions, but their own inclinations. And then they start the blame game of pointing their fingers at everything. The third point. The central purpose of Genesis 3 is to describe the mystery of sin not to explain its origin. Dennis Olson wrote, Sin is a mysterious force that arises from the good within God's good creation. The serpent is simply one of God's creatures, and the yearnings and submissions of the humans about God's motivations are somehow already embedded with the human heart from the beginning and simply needed the encouragement of the serpent to bring them out and convert them into action. Genesis 3 is not about describing the origins of sin and pointing you to a perfect world, but describing the human reality in our continual tendency to rebel against God who places our own good above what is good for God. God tells us we are good, but we take these words and tell people all the time they're not good. But if they do these steps, they will be good. They will be lovable. We are placed in a creation that God designed to provide food and water for everyone. But we have taken these resources and we just literally abuse the earth that produces them. And then we turn around and tell people, you need to work for food. The truth is, every morning you wake up, no matter what your age, you are placed into the same situation that Adam and Eve find themselves. There will be voices in your life providing you questions and alternatives to the goodness of God. They will be there in abundance. And you will be forced to decide, what voice are you going to listen to? Robin McGuire suggested I listen to the podcast, The Hidden Brain. It was a good suggestion, Robin. Thank you. All right. And uh, one I would suggest for you as well. So last week when Peggy and I It's like my favorite thing in the whole world. We listen to a really good podcast with a really good story, and then we get into the debate time. And we're moving at 70 miles an hour, so you can't get out of the car when you don't like what the other person says. But Peggy and I listened to this episode um, titled, Enemies of Gratitude. The Enemies of Gratitude. And the notes, as you read that story coming up, says, One of the mysteries of human behavior is that it is often easier for us to focus on what's going wrong and not what's going right. Why is this? 
If you strip away the popular junk associated with chapter 3 of Genesis, you will find that question clearly articulates what's going on in chapter 3. Why does the snake, why does Adam and Eve focus on what they do not have instead of just living into what they do? The hidden brain show opened with Shankar Vendatam saying, if you make $30,000 a year, if you make $30,000 a year, your income is 10 times the global medium and puts you in the top 5% of earners in the world. You are in the top 5%. And I got to be honest with you, those, that, that kind of hit me like a punch. Because we're in the house and we're trying to save up money to build, to put in a floor and it's taking a lot longer and I bemoan the fact that we're not making enough money or we didn't make enough money in the past and why does everybody else get this and I don't get it. Lack of gratitude. If you're 35 years old, if you're 35 years old, get on your knees and give thanks because you have lived longer than the vast majority of humans throughout history. The average lifespan of a human was uh, 30 years old. If you have a job, stable income, house, live in a democratic society and, a college education, and have a college education, you are in a rarefied group in human history because the vast majority of people never had any of that. If you ever go on vacation, you're probably in the top 2%. Interesting, my niece works in Zambia. She's working on a project that helps equip, um, actually, women to become farmers and independent farmers in Zambia. And she met a gentleman that she started a date there. And one of the things she did is decided to take this person who's lived his whole life in Zambia on one of the um, safaris. He lives in Africa, he lives in Zambia, he lives out in the country, he has never seen a giraffe. All the things that we see in a safari, he has never seen because he couldn't afford to go on the journey. They are paying for his college education, or at least helping to pay for his education, and it costs $200. The evening news, whether you choose the left, right, or center, is convincing you all the time we are going to hell in a handbasket. And we are going really fast. Are you going to listen to it? People running for office are going to try to convince you that we are, everything is broken and there's only one person that can fix it. Or, on the other hand, everything is going perfect and no one can fix it. If you go to that side, you're going to do this. Still, something's going to be broken. How truly bad is it right now? I mean, really bad. Is it really bad? Is it impossible? Super Bowl ads shine a bright light on everything you need. And there is a reason people pay millions of dollars for the Super Bowl ads because they know people listen to those voices. This Lenten season, we are seeking the answers to difficult questions. And today, the question is, who are you going to listen to? The one who desires good for you or the ones who want to make good off of you? Like Adam and Eve, we have a choice. We have the freedom to make that choice. God's going to keep on loving you no matter what with your choice. The only answer is could be the difference between living a life and living an abundant life. And I hope as we listen that we choose God's voice in an abundant life. Amen.